So Negroes and Guns um, strikes me as an important intervention in three ways. One, in the historiography of the black freedom movement. Um, over the years, there have been increasingly uh, new works that revise the way we understand the role of violence related to the, you know, the kind of uh, predominant narrative of nonviolence. Um, the other intervention, I think, is cultural in terms of who we see or think of when we think of gun owners, um, and also how we think about black resistance. And then finally, there is a public policy implication for your, your uh, presentation of the black tradition of arms. So I, I, I look forward to really getting into those three areas with you. But before, I, just, I was interested in hearing from you a little bit about your background and how you got into this topic. How did you arrive at this topic? Sure. Well, happy to be here, and and I, I think your sense about the uh, way the book encounters the current conversation is is, is accurate. Uh, my background in this is uh, there there are two influences, I suppose. So I grew up in in rural gun culture, uh, which was was black gun culture. So uh, everyone that I knew, all of the you know the, the good people of of the community, uh, my grandfather and father who were both uh, ministers, both owned guns and, 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 and so did everybody else in the community, really unapologi unapologetically. Um, and when I, when I got to law school, um, I found that there was, was a quite different impression about uh, something that I took as, as being sort of one of the clear fundamental rights and, and important sort of practical resources even before I could articulate something about uh, fundamental rights. So uh, th there's, there was this tension that um, operated in the way that I was, was sort of dealing with what I knew in my bones versus uh, what I heard in law school and then the, the kind of, of uh, cultural uh, response to our firearms issues that I got in, in lots of the, the, the venues that I was operating in uh, after law school. So certainly at, at Harvard, the, uh, the sense in, in the early 80s when I was there was, uh, oh well, that Second Amendment thing, uh, we don't really need to talk about that. And it was sort of a glib dismissal of, of something that, that culturally was, was quite important to me in the community that I had grown up in. That's interesting. So where 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 did you grow uh, up? I grew up in rural West Virginia. Okay. So yeah, so, yeah my, my grandparents um, had had you know had a garden. They didn't have a telephone, and you know I remember at seven years old they still did not have a telephone. They were half an hour away from any sort of police response, and they also uh, needed and used guns uh, in in terms of sort of uh, daily life. So you know there was hog killing, there was uh, keeping the pests out of out of the garden, uh, but th there were also sort of a, a clear recognition, I think, in, in the community that on matters of personal security, uh, the government, the state was really sort of deep in the background and, and almost irrelevant. So in your, in your book, you really, uh, I feel, try to recover this, this tradition and, and put it in a long mm -hmm. historical mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. so, so let's, I, I, I wanted to hear, you know, when you talk about the black tradition of arms, what exactly is the black tradition sure. of arms? So it, it is almost a, a repeat of, of, of what I suggested. It is, it is church people and strivers and merchants um, embracing gun ownership, gun use, carrying guns, uh, armed self-defense as a sort of practical necessity and as, as an important response to that period of state failure, that is, that place in uh, any sort of, of um, violent encounter where uh, the, the state just is, is not able to, to respond. And, and you, f you find this uh, occurring very early on. So uh, as, as you said, uh, the, the book actually, after the introduction, which focuses on the Robert Williams mm -hmm. case that, that maybe we can talk about in a bit. Uh, the, the book talks in the uh, chapter titled Foundations uh, about the earliest iterations of this, that is fugitive slaves stealing guns, acquiring guns, and, and fighting off slave catchers, uh, sometimes very successfully uh, in, in ways that, are, that just defy our sort of walking around expectations about how, um, yeah, how escaped slaves were, were faring and the kind of, of assistance that they got. But what, what we find really is uh, that this tradition goes back as, as far as we can trace the, the, the black American experience. Yeah, so you started uh, with Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And I think uh, for many people who've read the narrative of the life of Frederick sure. Douglass, I think we're familiar with this, this fight with, that right. he had with his, his former master that became the turning point right. in his kind of right. coming to sense right. of self. Right. Um, 
What was what I didn't know about, or what I didn't, what I knew less about, was some of the other examples that yeah. you gave. And I yeah. thought, like one in particular was the case. I don't know if you can talk about William Parker sure. and Christiana. So, so the Christiana resistance in in um, central, lower central Pennsylvania uh, was was prompted by a fellow named William Parker, who was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And the there, there are lots of instances in the first chapter where you get sort of snippets, uh, something a newspaper report, uh, slaves fire. On, on pursuers and then you don't hear anything more right. about it. Um, the thing that is, is interesting about the Parker case is that William Parker, who uh, as a slave was illiterate, uh, at one point or another, and people contest this, uh, at some point along the way learned how to read and write and wrote actually his own narrative recounting the Christiana resistance. So uh, he, was, he was sheltering uh, two or three slaves at his, his home in, in Christiana. Um, their, their slave master uh, obtained a warrant in Philadelphia under the, the new version of the Fugitive Slave Law, the, the 1850 version, um, there, there were black spies right there on, on at the doorstep wow. who, who found out that uh, this, this fellow uh, had gotten the warrant, was coming to um, uh, Parker's homestead with two U.S. Marshals. Uh, the word got there ahead of, of the slave catchers and uh, ahead of, of the Marshals, and, and black folk from, from the surrounding community gathered together with with guns and cutlery, and by the end of it, the the marshals, the one of the slave catchers, were, were, were was was dead. Uh, several others were right. wounded. Uh, then William Parker and the two fugitives end up um, running north. They and, and on on Parker's telling, and it, it was just wonderful because I I didn't actually know the the, the details of, of all of this until uh, I got deeply into the book. Uh, on Parker's telling of this, he says we were sheltered at a friend's house in Rochester. And then you read into Frederick Douglass's narrative and he says, uh, he talks about how, well, these people from Christiana, and then he names Parker uh, explicitly, uh, they came, they sheltered at my house, I helped them across, and, and the ending scene, you, you, you couldn't write it better. Um, the ending scene is is Douglas and, and Parker on the ferry, and as Douglas is about to get off and send them across into Canada, Parker takes out of his pocket the the he he calls it the uh, the revolver snatched from the the dead hand of the slaver Gorish, <laughs> and so it's it's like the, the ending scene of a movie. But there there are there are countless uh, examples like this uh, with with less detail, uh, and some of them appear actually in William Still's account. William Still, who some call the the founder. Of the, the Underground Railroad, who wrote this this long 800-page exposition on uh, fugitive slaves who were coming through through Philadelphia. Three of the images in the book showing fugitive slaves firing guns against mm. uh, slave catchers come from William Still's uh, images in in the original account. So. One of the dis distinctions that you make early on in talking about the black tradition of arms is the distinction between self-defense and political violence. So I wonder if you could walk us through sure. why why this distinction was important. What, what, first of all, what self-defense is, how you're defining self-defense, sure. and how you're defining political violence. Sure. And why this distinction is important. Okay, so, so it, it is important and it, it's my primary analytical contribution in, in the work. And so this book is based on uh, a more scholarly piece that, that I um, published in, in the Connecticut Law Review in, in 2012. And what I, what I found and what I argue is, and, or what I show f over and over again, is that, that black people made a distinction between political violence and self-defense, and they, they saw political violence as folly. Well, of political violence as a risk, and by political violence, articulated in, in different details from from uh, using different details uh, by different people. Um, what they meant by political violence is trying to advance the race, trying to get uh, political rights, uh, arguing about the, the right to vote, arguing about the you know access to 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 schools, all of the things that we think about when we think about uh, group rights. Uh, the idea was that we're not going to prevail using violence uh, on those sorts of questions. On the other hand, 
self-defense. Self-defense is this individual um, response to a threat that occurs within that window of imminence that is the place where it is impossible for the state, even if the state turns out to be uh, not a malevolent state, even if the st state turns out to be operating uh, motivated by goodwill, you still have to recognize that there's a place just as a matter of physics where the state can't respond. And on those sorts of 